So with that, I'll bring the meeting to order. Are there any changes or additions to the agenda as presented? Uh, one change, um, let me grab this here. The Planning Commission report, um, you know, uh, uh, Charles informed me that he would not be here to make the report today uh, and they didn't really have anything to report. So there weren't really, did, we can kind of move right over that. Did everybody see the note from Charlie? Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll take that off the agenda. Any other additions, deletions, or changes? Uh, a heads up on uh, Sheriff Marcou. Um, his scheduling has to be a little bit fluid tonight. Uh, so 7.30 is an estimate, but that's not... Uh, we might have to accommodate a little bit if he's a little early or a little late or or something like that. Okay. And I see Mike is starting to come online. Give him just a second. Okay, Mike, we can see you. Your mic is disabled. We're just going over any additions or changes to the agenda. And is there anyone who has <clears throat> any other changes? If not, uh, is the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes of December 21st? I had a question on it. When it came down to the appointment uh, authorization for uh, me to sign the uh, pledge contract with Deborah Alexander, I wondered who suggested that, that I be the signatory. I think it was Mike. It was. It was, okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. Any other uh, discussion on the meeting minutes or are we prepared to approve? I move to approve. A motion, do we have a second? Second. Motion is second, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? And Mike, your mic is still disabled. If you can hear me. Uh, click to, okay. Yeah, your, your microphone's up now. Mike, can you hear me? Yeah, it said my uh, internet connection is unstable up here okay. for some reason, but I uh, reconnected all of the uh, connections and it appears as if it's working now. So we just voted on approving the meeting minutes for the record. Did you vote in favor? <laughs> I didn't vote at all. I, I wasn't even around. I didn't hear a thing. Evidently, I had a cord problem or something. Well, in light of that, I guess I better do a roll call on the, uh, the vote that was just cast for the, the meeting minutes. Uh, Nat, how do you vote? Yes. Carl, how do you vote? Yes. Doug, how do you vote? Yes. And Mike, how do you vote? President. Okay. Uh, abstain. And the motion passes. And Rosemary, you got the floor. We can't hear you, Rosemary. Try and unmute again, Rosemary. There you go. I don't have too much for tonight. Tax abatement requests from the Hooyers by the, the house by the powerhouse bridge. Do you want to do that before your next board meeting? Sure. At 630? Yes. And Petitions for officers are due on the 25th. And so far for select board, I have received one for a three year from Beth Foy and a two year for Eben Patch. Okay. Do you know of anybody who may be interested in serving as a more regional solid waste director? 
I have not heard of anyone. Did we have that posted? Their term is up, so that it would have to be an election too. Okay. Oh, so who's That's serving currently? It was Phil Wilson, but he moved and accepted his resignation. Okay, we never replaced him? Yes. So we didn't receive any volunteers to replace him, so. Okay, so unless somebody submits a application, we'll probably be uh, uh, reappointing someone if we can shake the tree hard enough, get somebody fall out. Unless somebody gets 25 votes as a write-in. Yes, as a write-in. Okay, I guess if anybody is heard of or knows of somebody who might be interested or do a good job at the solid waste district, you know, please encourage them to uh, get the rosemary and get that consent form so they can get their name on the ballot. And the only other thing I had was the um, warrants for Eric to sign. That's the board's pleasure. We move we authorize Eric to uh, sign the warrants for this month. Second. That motion is second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? And I'll probably be in. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry. No, I interrupted accidentally. No. Um, I was just wondering about the tree warden. Did we ever re replace the tree? Didn't uh, resign? The tree warden is fine. We're also uh, going to be. Uh, reposting for our fire warden. I do think we've got somebody in mind, but we're going to uh, make sure it's posted and circulated properly. That's what I meant to say. I'm sorry, fire warden. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll skip over the planning commission report. And I guess we can get right into your start on your report, uh, sure. Brian. And if Roger comes on, we can jump over to him. All right. So uh, the first thing is I want to give an update on the salt truck um, and, and kind of what's going on there. Um, as you recall, well, I guess uh, what happened was this last week, our salt truck, uh, the rear differential broke down again. This is the same problem uh, that this particular truck has had on multiple occasions. Uh, this is the reason that this truck is being replaced a little bit early on our uh, our modified, we had to modify the capital equipment plan to replace it a little bit early. Um, and, and this is why, is, is that this point of failure has happened multiple times. We're submitting it as a warranty claim. Uh, we might get some pushback on that, but Clark's is in agreement with us that this is a warranty problem, that this is... Uh, a failure in parts that have a, uh, a warranty that is separate from the warranty of the, the vehicle as a whole because of their replacement. Um, we are in the meantime uh, going to be uh, making do with, uh, we bought a, a full bed spreader for the pickup truck. Um, what we had before our, our new road foreman uh, Hugh was concerned about the time it would take, um, you know, and we had not really had to deal with extended downtimes um, before this. So we were concerned about uh, kind of how much time it took with the, the replacement that we had before. So uh, we bought a new full bed salt spreader for the pickup truck. Um, the old tow behind spreader that we had, we sold to the village uh, to recover, recover some of our costs. Um, the spreader that we've got for the pickup truck, we'll be able to use in the future for some of the small roads and things that are difficult to get our uh, full size or even the uh, small loader down. So some of our, our, our small back roads we'll still be able to use the pickup uh, and it'll go from about, uh, say about eight loads with the previous uh, spreader to about one to one and a half loads uh, to cover the same area with the, this full bed spreader. Um, cost us a few thousand dollars. It's not, wasn't cheap, but it was kind of necessary for this replacement. Um, 
I, we don't have a date yet on when the truck is going to be back, uh, but we're told that it is going to be an extended period um, that we'll have to deal with without, without the tandem. And there are no rental units available at this time. So, hence the spreader. Anybody got any questions? Yeah, I'm wondering what a few thousand dollars is. Uh, I believe it came to $4,300. Uh, minus 600 that we recovered from selling the old spreader. And and do you have any idea what the extended, you know, is there any different nice definition to extended period of downtime? I don't have anything better for you at, at this time about how long that's going to take. Uh, just Clark's kind of informally told us that they have a lot on their schedule right now. Um, and that they are, they're behind. Um, and like I said, when we also acquired about rental units, we weren't going to be able to rent a uh, full-size salt truck. Ryan, do we have just one salt truck? We have one dedicated salt truck. Right, but the other plows, you can, you can have salt and gravel coming out the back of it, right? They, but we don't have a spreader for them. So uh, it's, uh, okay. it's not a very good application. We don't get very uniform application across the road. It wastes a lot of material uh, and it's not a good use of their time. Uh, mm. So we really, we want to have a, a spreader. Yeah. Uh, and ideally we want to have a computer controlled spreader, which is what our dedicated truck has. Got it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, that actually, I, if I can bring up a related point on the new truck, um, if we want to have a, we're gonna have to make a decision in pretty short order if we want to have brine as a, an option for the new truck. It will take some modification um, to the, uh, it'll take some modifications to the, the bed and the way the bed is mounted to the frame in order to accommodate the brine attachment. So they want to do that um, as a part of the initial outfitting rather than a retrofit. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it would be about an additional thousand dollars for us to have a, a brine attachment. Who's, uh, who's, if interested. who's they when you say they want us to do this? Uh, Clark's. Okay. Uh, they do the outfitting uh, of the, the equipment for us. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, when would we make that decision? Um, I can ask for more time to make the decision. They would like us to make the decision as soon as possible. Yeah. I um, uh, have been pretty outspoken in the past about not um, wanting to move to Brian. Um, and I can, if, if this is the time for the discussion, I, I was hoping you know, our, our new highway uh, worker, uh, Mark, Mark, is pretty in favor of Brian, and I actually want to have a chance to talk to him and perhaps Hugh about their views on it too. But my views on it are that the all of the great reasons that make it so effective and um, favorable for, um, for clearing roads are also conditions, are also uh, factors that go into the material, the brine material staying on your car, car for longer, being more effective to a colder degree, therefore longer through the winter, it's it's working to um, uh, rust up your vehicles, our vehicles, um, town vehicles, personal vehicles, bridges, um, culverts, guardrails, all of these things are, are just, it, um, getting hammered by Brian, and I think that the costs are still really unknown. Um, but I, my sense is that they're pretty, they're pretty great, especially on personal vehicles. I think Mike would like to. I uh, echo uh, what Nat said, and everybody knows I have made the same comments uh, in the past. And uh, sometimes I wonder uh, these big proponents of Brian had stock in these companies. Uh, they seem to be pushing this stuff all the time. I agree that it sticks to your car. It uh, rusts out your car even faster. Uh, but then you have all these people that said, oh, no, no. All it does is speed the process up on the road. 
Well, if it speeds the process up on the road, it speeds the process up on your cars and your trucks, as far as I'm concerned. And as long as I'm on the board, I will have absolutely nothing to do with Brian. Period. Anyone um, else got an opinion? Oh. <laughs> Kyle? <laughs> Um, not that passionate, funny, crazy enough, <laughs> but um, I guess, yeah, I, it would be good to see, see those statistics. It would be good to kind of, you know, get maybe a, 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 some kind of information presentation together about the, about the two different options, because um, if, it sounds like people who are really passionately against it are real, you know, really against it, people that are really for it are really for it. So it, I, it's hard for me to make an informed decision without knowing sort of the, the facts and figures. And would that, would it be possible to get something like that? I think together, I can do it, Brian, uh, before we make a, a big decision here. I, I can try and get something a little bit more detailed for you than just hearsay, but um, yeah, the, the, some of it's a little hard to say that the, the purpose or the goal behind it is that it would, is not that it would, I mean, it is effective at a lower temperature and for longer through the winter. Uh, but our real goal with it is that it would, uh, with good application, it'll stick to the road uh, better than salt will under some weather conditions. Uh, and that's really, that's what we as a, a, a uh, road management, what we would want out of it is, uh, for it to stick to the road more than to stick to the car. So we would be managing uh, application temperatures and application amounts to get as much as possible on the road and uh, not onto vehicles and other things. But um, that's a best case scenario. That, that's our goal. We'll, yeah. We don't know how effective we would be at it. Well, I'd oh, also be oh, curious, oh. I'm sorry, just one other comment. I'd be curious to know environmentally the differences between the two, just in terms of going into our waterways and... and Environmentally, brine is a little bit better. Um, it is the, uh, basically the same material, uh, and, but it is, it does stick better than salt. Mm -hmm. So, the, 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 the counterpoint to this is under, under the right conditions, it sticks to the road. Under the wrong conditions, uh, it doesn't stick to the road that well and it gets picked up by vehicles. Um, but it does stick better than plain rock salt. Mm -hmm. which, so in that case, would you switch to the rock salt if it like, if the temperatures weren't quite right, you could flip between the two depending on the weather? That would be the idea is so on a computer controlled system on the salt truck uh, with temperature sensors, we're going to get on the new truck, we're going to have road temperature sensors so that we can sense, we can determine the, the exact temperature of the road to control the rate of distribution of salt. And uh, those are also affected by the speed of the vehicle and can be dialed up or down on location depending on surface type and, and a few other things. Uh, Mark, mm -hmm. our, our new employee is quite familiar with using them. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the brine would be used in, under its best temperature range, rock salt under its best temperature range, and just sand under its best temperature range. Um, but yeah, the, the brine does stick better. But yeah, it, ideally so it sticks to the road. Less ideally, it could stick to cars or, or other things. Well, it definitely does stick to the, so, but the effective temperature for corrosiveness goes from this to this. Yeah. Which is what makes it so attractive at melting ice, mm -hmm. but it's also what makes it so attractive for um, uh, auto mechanics to change out your rotors every two years. Doug, we haven't heard from you. Oh, I know very little about this. I, I certainly wouldn't want to melt down our winter roads sufficient to have the greasy clay come out on our, where you squidge all the way across at corners. And uh, I, I, I just don't know. I think driving slow is useful. 
Absolutely. Yeah, good point. I think if, if I had to vote tonight, I would vote against it because I, I want to hear some convincing argument on what the benefits are and why we should go to it. And, you know, whether we get Mark to come in and plead his case or someone else, but, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear what the compelling arguments are for supporting it. And I haven't heard it yet. I'm wondering if there's a difference in, in, in utility uh, on gravel roads versus asphalt roads. I also wonder how, how well the coordination between sand, rock salt, and brine is, you know, um, what the storage issues would be or not be in usage. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mike's really right about one, well, about many things, but um, on the point that a lot of the data and literature that's out there has been put out by the industry. And when you, when you Google around about it, it's about all of the benefits and all the glory and how it's really not any more corrosive than, than rock salt. Well, it's not more corrosive, it's just effective over a longer period of time and it's sticking to your car. So right. the, longer, the longer your car is sitting in the garage, the more it's, the rust is uh, coming through. Uh, we do have a couple of public comments. Yeah. Okay, why don't we, if the board members are all uh, had their opportunity, and I believe they all have, we'll open up the public. Okay. All right, Beth, uh, go ahead and unmute. Thanks. Um, my first comment is I've always commuted to my job, which means I have followed state trucks on state highways, um, both dumping brine and rock salt. And I don't know what the studies say, but I will never believe that brine works as well or better than rock salt in any condition. I've been on some pretty hairy drives and I can tell you that the brine is way scarier uh, on the ride than following a truck dumping salt. So I don't know what the studies say. I don't care what the studies say. My personal opinion is brine is not, does not live up to what uh, folks say it does or doesn't do. The other thing I just want to say is to Mike's point, I don't know that the companies who are selling these trucks necessarily have stock in these things, but they do have a benefit for trucks rusting out sooner. Um, I am good friends with one of the guys from Clark's. I like him a lot. I like, I don't have a problem with the family at all. But it is to their advantage if our trucks rust out sooner because they're one of the only, only really big truck suppliers in our region. So um, I'm not saying that's why they're pushing it, but if I were them, <laughs> that might be one of the reasons I'm pushing it. So just something to consider. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. Outstanding, Beth. Beth, can I just ask you, when you say it's it was really scary to be behind a brine truck, what did you mean by that? Like, I'm trying to envision this because I don't commute at all. Is it like sloshing out or what, 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 what it made it makes scary? The, it makes the surface, yeah, I, I think, <laughs> thanks for asking, Kyle. It mm -hmm. makes the surface like icy slushy, like that really, it's a weird, mm -hmm. it's a weird sensation, but you know how like, when it's in between a melting stage and a solid stage, yeah. um, it's like that weird icy slush and you really can't control your vehicle. I mean, you have to be careful. Mm. So that is really, I would much rather drive, frankly, on a really icy road because I know what to expect than that slushy stuff that you can't really do anything about. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Yep. Thanks, Beth. Thanks. And then I've got Greg and uh, Scott, I see your hand. I'll have you up after Greg. Yeah, we have experience with the brine uh, in our trucks, uh, especially our trucks and trailers. It gets into the uh, brake drums and the brake cans and also into the wiring harnesses. Yeah. We haven't seen uh, anything like this until they started using brine and we we tried to uh, influence people to eliminate brine in the state of Vermont actually and uh, I don't know the difference in uh, environmentally which is better or worse I can't believe it's probably much difference but I will say rock salt has some grit to it like Beth was saying you know this 
brine as a liquid and it, it does turn as slushy and in rock salt will have some grit like a sand or a you know something with some substance so it's definitely harder on cars i mean we've seen it in our business uh, big time especially with our trucks and trailers but also our pickups and uh, you know wiring harnesses it gets in the frame where the holes are in the frame and uh, it sticks like glue in there so uh, and it's hard to get out so it's uh, I would recommend no, not here. And I don't think we get enough. Do we have enough pavement to really make it worthwhile anyway? Most of it's dirt roads, I think. So I don't know, that's my two cents. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. Thank you, Greg and Scott. Hey everybody. Yeah, so VW did sponsor a study um, indicating exactly what everybody's saying, that there is an increase in rust and corrosion. I haven't read it, so I don't know how good it is, but they did sponsor a study not too long ago. I can look it up and try to send it to you, Brian, if you need it. And That'd the other great. thing is, too, uh, I have a couple of friends that are mechanics, and during this time of year, their backs actually get burned from all the slush and crap when we drop our cars off. Um, gets in their eyes, burns their eyes. It's sort of corrosive and nasty. Um, you know, so for an employee health part of this too, this equation, um, don't forget about our, our mechanics. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Okay, is there any other comments out there? I'm not I think seeing Mike's, any. Mike would like this. Go ahead, Mike. I'll make a motion that we don't have any Brian in the town of Johnson. Well, if we don't take I, any action, we won't. We won't have. <laughs> well, I thought I thought we were going to discuss whether we were or we weren't, and uh, Brian is trying to push it, and I just like to put it to bed right now, and uh, get it over with, so we don't have to discuss it anymore. We we've been round and round with this uh, numerous times over the last couple of years. And to tell you the truth, I'm getting sick of talking about it. And uh, I would like to just put it to bed tonight. Well, there is a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Lacking a second, the motion will fail. And the motion fails. I can't believe this. I'm making a motion and we're not gonna use any Brian and Johnson. And, and we have a couple of people that are against it, but I can't even get a second for it. I just don't understand it. Really, I don't. Yeah. My thought, Mike, it wasn't on our agenda and it wouldn't be included in, in the salt truck. Well, we had to make a, make a decision whether or not we were going to have uh, Brian on the truck or not. And so I just figured that we would say no and I would bring it through with a motion. No. And I asked for a little bit more of a presentation. I mean, all these testimonies are really great and I, and you know, I'm, I'm gathering a lot of information, but I think it would be really nice to be able to have Hugh or Hugh and Mark or somebody, you know. Well, fine, fine. We'll talk about it next time. No, or, I just, or the time after that. And that's my thinking too. It's just that, I mean, I obviously have a pretty strong opinion, but I also want to keep an open mind and um, I know that at least one of our highway workers has um, has indicated that he's, he favors it pretty strongly. So I, I do want to listen to them. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Thank you. Uh, I see Roger has piped in and it's right about exactly on the, the hour, the half hour. Uh, so thank you, Roger, for joining us. I hope you can hear me all right. He froze up on me. Yeah, it looks to me like he might be frozen also. Okay. Give him a second, see if he comes back. And I think to your, uh, Mike, to your point, the more appropriate method is you would vote to have a brine truck, uh, uh, outfitted truck, and the vote would be uh, defeated, that would be the more appropriate way than to vote 
not to do something that if you don't do nothing, it doesn't get done anyway. Okay. That's what I understand. But my point is, I do not want to see Brian in town. Okay. Okay, Roger, we can see you again. Can you hear us? Yes. Good okay. evening, everybody. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, we just did want to take a little bit of your time and talk about some of the budgets. I believe you've passed over at least uh, preliminary budgets for the uh, communication and patrol. Right. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Yep. Yes. Okay, so I sent uh, two budgets and forgive me if you're going to be looking at the top of my shiny head here, but I'm looking down at the uh, um, So one budget uh, last January or so uh, we uh, were notified that there was a series of COPS grants. Those were citizen oriented uh, uh, community oriented policing grants available. We took a shot and went through the process. And uh, I think a week before COVID hit, we found out that we had been granted um, um, a grant position, which would fund an entry level deputy uh, to, um, to bring um, our, our patrol staff up to six people, uh, I'm sorry, up to seven people plus the, uh, the detective. So in the way that there's these grants work is, is that the first year, it's a four year grant. The first year they pay 75% of that position, the next year 50, the next year after that 25, and the fourth year you're obligated to completely fund it. And then you've lived up to the grant re uh, requirements. So, we um, did an exercise here where we presented a budget that has that grant position in, but we also presented a budget that did not have that extra person and it would be uh, in a normal year. And that's the one I'll start with. And basically uh, we had an agreement, I think we made uh, with Nat in our, in our, um, our committee that met, um, you know, for the last several summers, we met once a month all, all summer to talk about issues and, and the budget. Uh, and uh, so that come November, December, it wouldn't be a surprise to the select boards. This would have been worked out throughout the summer. And of course, this year um, uh, that didn't happen for a couple of reasons. One is being because of the COVID uh, issue and then the other one is is because last year we agreed that for the next three years starting last year that we would cap the the budget at three percent increase each of those years and the boards voted on that and accepted it so uh eric does everybody have a copy of this or are you and i the only ones looking at it or uh, actually, none of us have it in front of us, or I do not. I'm not sure if any board members do. No. Okay. All right, Brian, did you get that? The communications budget? No, it would have been the patrol budget. We, we sent it. Well, I asked that it be sent to you. I hope that it... I don't believe I have the patrol budget. Uh, we spoke yeah. about the number, but I don't think I got a... All right, so there were three three budgets that we did send to you or, or two budgets plus the assessment for communication. So I apologize uh, for whatever reason, I was hoping that that would have gotten distributed to all of you. But so, so basically um, in a normal year, our budget would have gone up 4.29%. And uh, the salary item uh, would have gone up 5%, but the big increase uh, this year was our retirement in which we're still in a 30 year retirement, but that went up 40%, 40.46%. And I'll make sure that we get this, this out to you all tomorrow. And I apologize. Uh, I was hoping that you'd have it tonight. So, uh, so having said that, uh, you know, we're still capping our budget as agreed upon for 3%. So we've gone from 1.29% uh, 
one million one hundred and sixty four thousand to one million two hundred and fourteen or two hundred and fifty four thousand uh, if you count the um, uh, the cruiser the forty thousand dollar cruiser so let me just correct myself the 2021 budget was one million two hundred and four thousand and you went to one million two hundred and fifty four thousand for the entire budget. The assessment for Johnson uh, went from 481,000 last year to 496,000 this year. So, and again, that's a 33% uh, um, or excuse me, 3% increase. And uh, the Sheriff's Department again is contributing uh, uh, $40,000 for that cruiser. So that's what that's looking like. Uh, and uh, right now we just, we've just lost, we've lost two people within the last two months out of patrol. Um, and so we're gonna be re refilling one of those positions in about a week. But, you know, as usual, we're having a, a difficult time holding on to the people we have, let alone add this other position for the uh, COPS grant. So just to share um, that total for that budget uh, would be uh, 1,324,000 as opposed to 1,254,000. So uh, that's what that would look like with that increased position. So there's two reasons that are pretty common in terms of why we keep losing people. The retirement aspect is one and the other one is is that people don't want to work alone. And um, and you know I found that in the exit interviews um, that people are going to uh, situations where they're working in teams. I lost uh, my young rookie, and he's gone to Winooski, and he's going to be working on a team with several people. So uh, in terms of, uh, with respect to the retirement issue, I have uh, been, to, I was in a hearing a couple of, uh, probably three weeks ago, and now we are, we have asked for a meeting with, um, I have asked for a meeting with Senator Jane Kitchell, who is the chair of the Senate Appropriations. Senator Jeanette White, who's the chair of um, uh, Senate GovOps. And I'm um, hoping that Rich Westman will be able to make that meeting as well, because it's pretty apparent to me that we are not ever gonna get the support of uh, Beth Pierce, our, our Treasury Secretary. So, and, um, so I expect that that meeting will happen within a week or so. I've had Susan Bartlett from Hyde Park on one of those meetings. And uh, certainly I can let the board know when the next meeting is. And um, you know, I think that uh, pressure is the only, the only way that we're gonna get any headway here. So um, I'll keep quiet a minute and uh, any questions. Okay, uh, first of all, Roger, am I right in assuming that what you're requesting for the retirement benefit doesn't cost the state anything, it's just allowing your deputies to be part of the retirement system? Yes. Um, so we're, in the last hearing, um, what did come out of that was, uh, that it was gonna to have to come out of the sheriff's pockets and that would be the state sheriffs, but that they conduct a, um, uh, a cost analysis of what it would cost uh, to have those deputies. And there's probably, I'm guessing maybe, you know, 40, 50, 60 right in there deputies statewide to, to come into this system. But the statute says that we're allowed in the state retirement system as long as we pay the costs. And so we're not asking anything unreasonable from those folks, uh, but uh, here we are. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
any board members got questions for Roger on the patrol budget before we go over to the communication? And why don't you go ahead, Roger, on the communications, then I'll open it back up to board members, and then we'll open it up to the public for general questions. All right. <clears throat> the communications budget, um, what I have with me here is the assessments, and I don't have the, the budget itself, but the bottom line is, is that the, the, the budget decreased by 6.47%. Last year, it decreased by 3.35%. So as I told Norm Andrews, our accountant, that we're trending in the right direction, I guess. Um, so what that means for Johnson is this year, um, you have a decrease of Uh, 3.13 percent, uh, and it's a $2,277 increase, which brings your amount to $72,798. And then last year, it was... Uh, Roger, I think you might have that backwards. Yeah, I could. Do you have that with you, uh, Brian? I, I do have that one. Uh, okay, I did get the, right. the communications budget. So okay, we'll yes, I see. Yes, yes, I just put a ruler here so I could follow it. All right. So last year, uh, your budget was seventy-two thousand seven hundred ninety-eight. This year, it's seventy thousand uh, seventy thousand five hundred and twenty-one. Correct, Brian. I have 68,115 for this year. Okay, let me see. Okay, more to follow on that. That's the latest I have here from Norm is, is that. Um, and 68,000 would bring you even uh, down even more. This so, is, uh, this, one, this one is marked proposed. So it's not, uh, yeah. it's not your final budget. Okay. All right, so I apologize, I'll follow up on that. But the bottom line is, is that there will be a decrease there of 3% uh, of or over 3%, so. Great. What, what was some of the reasons behind the, dec the yeah. decrease? Um, last year, we had George Sparrow retire. This year, Gary Underwood has retired. Okay. So these were 30 year plus employees. And uh, uh, so that those were the significant drivers of, of uh, this decreasing. So we have an interesting situation brewing here with the uh, with our nine one one system. And I I will wait to see for sure. But on January or January fifteenth, there is a very high likelihood that the administration will recommend that the E911 board uh, be, uh, well, the E911, the entire operation be put under the Department of Public Safety. So right now it's controlled by a board made of representatives from, from, from Vermont firefighters, from EMS, uh, from the Vermont police chiefs, from the sheriffs, and uh, that's going to change. And it looks like um, there is a good likelihood that the legislature uh, uh, will create an agency of public safety much bigger and 911 will be put under it. And the board uh, would probably be advisory uh, in nature. And I don't know what's gonna to happen to our local PSAPs. I think, uh, uh, a lot of you know that uh, Lamoille County started 911 back in 1975, I think. And, uh, and then in 1998, the state got in the game. And, uh, but um, we receive about $90,000 a year from, from 911 to, uh, as a stipend more or less to help them answer calls. And uh, what that does is that basically puts one person in a seat. And if we were to lose that money, uh, uh, 
that would cost us a position. And it also would, uh, would eliminate us from being the primary E911 call takers, which is first time in 40 some odd years, we wouldn't be doing that. So, mm -hmm. so uh, more to, to follow on that shortly, I think, so. Thank you, Roger. I'll open it up to board members. Anybody got any questions for Roger? I just have a question. Go ahead, um, Kyle. Thanks. Hi, Hi Roger. Time. Happy New Year. Um, Same to you. It's hard for me to ask pointed questions because we don't have any any of the numbers in front of us, but you also said there was going to be a decrease in the patrol. Is that true? From past years, from 4.9 in past years to three something this year? Is that what well, I heard you say? Well, you heard me say that, and perhaps I didn't articulate it very well. What we agreed to last year is that for the next three years, you would the, the, the towns would see no more no more than a three percent increase. So the increase for this year was four point one percent, four point one five percent, and will be the sheriff's department will be managing that extra one point one five percent. So you'll only see an increase of three percent. Uh, even though the budget is going up higher than that. Okay, but we would, um, okay, so the department would be eating that other one point whatever percent, but we wouldn't be losing any patrol or coverage or, or, or the normal service. You, you won't be, no, you won't be losing any service and, uh, um, you know, really what this causes us to do is to try to be, as efficient as as possible, and we always try to do that. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, the thinking behind this, and in that, correct me if if I'm wrong, but uh, um, was to try to give this committee that's meeting um, a chance to to take a look at you know what the future is of law enforcement for the town of Johnson and all of the towns is going to be looking like. So. Uh, we'll figure a way to to manage without losing any service. What's hurting us right now with, is just um, this constant training people and, and uh, our core people stay, but there's always one or two out of that group that leave, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and we've talked about that a little bit. Um separately from this and just potential, you know, just some creative ways of, of um, recruiting and also thinking about, um, you know, the, the role that social workers could play versus, you know, um, uh, more traditional um, cops or folks coming straight out of the military or whatnot as, as an idea that's trending right now nationally also. Yeah, the only thing with the, the you know the social workers is is we work with them hand in hand, but we just have to keep them safe in some sometimes some pretty volatile situations. So, but it's you know I'm I'm open for everything. We've got this committee that's going to be maybe looking at different ways of doing things, and yeah, just try to keep working together to yeah. see you know what we can do to serve. The people of Johnson's. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Doug. Good evening. I, I'm wondering. Hi, Doug. Um, hi. I, the, is the, the, the detect, boy, is the detective a part of the patrol budget? Yes, he is. Okay. What do you, what, how would you assess the effectiveness of the detective in, as far as what you envisioned it would be? And I, I think it's been. I think a detective is one of the busier people in, in, in the patrol division, um, particularly with the amount of, of um, uh, sexual assault investigations, particularly with um, young people. Uh, so I think that, uh, I think that we would have a difficult time uh, 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 continuing on in this day and age without that that position. So um, I don't know how other to answer it other than maybe uh, some statistics and things that I don't have readily available here. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Well, if I can jump in, Roger, you know, those statistics are, um, when we've looked at them in past years, have been, um, I don't want to say interesting, but actually startling and, and disturbing. Um, just to, it's something that's not talked about a lot um, for obvious reasons, but um, uh, it's something that the detective is spending an awful lot of time doing a lot of investigations that have to do with sexual abuse. I anticipated when we did create the position several years ago that the detective would be working more on burglaries and fraud and, and uh, drug investigations, but uh, um, it's, it's another factor that, that happened to come along is, is that the state did away with a grant uh, that used to help pay for a dedicated detective uh, that worked out of the state's attorney's office. That, that's no longer available. So now all of the towns and the state police, uh, when, a, when a sexual assault investigation comes into your jurisdiction, you're expected to investigate it. Any other board members? If not, I would open it up to the public. Any public members got questions for Sheriff Marcou? You see anyone, Brian? I'm not seeing anybody. Uh, remember, if you would like to ask a question, um, you can raise your hand. It's under the participants tab in the uh, in the Zoom controls. I see Beth's hand, um, Brian. Oh, I see. Sorry, Beth. There you are. No problem. Thanks, um, <laughs> Sheriff Marco. Uh, my question is: You mentioned that it's in statute that um, your the sheriff's department is allowed to go into the retirement plan through the state if you pay for it. Um, my question is, are there other county sheriff departments that are currently um, doing just that? Or are you the first trying to? Um, so the, the statute in Title 24 says that, um, that again, that we're, we're allowed into the state retirement system as long as we pay the costs associated with that. So in about wasn't too long after I became sheriff, maybe 2004 or five, right in that area. Uh, we entered into the retirement system in a 30 year plan. The problem with that plan was, is that the towns of Stowe, Morristown, state police, all the state agencies. In fact, every law enforcement agency in the state except six sheriff's departments, um, um, had the option of going to the 20-year plan. So there are currently uh, Lamoille County and maybe five or six other sheriff's departments that are, are we're told by the secretary uh, that you cannot uh, move from group F. You're in group F, 30-year plan for life. There are some sheriff's departments that are in the uh, the Vermont Municipal Retirement uh, Employees Retirement System, Deemers. And that is exactly the same uh, um, plan that's, they have exactly the same plans available to them that Stowe and Morristown does. Why some sheriff's departments are in the municipal plan and some are in the state plan, I don't know how that happened. But uh, uh, we're attempting to rectify that because if we're lucky enough to, to hire somebody, um, that's one half of the battle. The other one is keeping the person when they're being lured away with, with these 20 year plans. Yeah, I, I understand all of that, that part of it. Um, so my follow-up question is, does, is there a cost benefit of moving or is this an employee benefit? Like, what are you looking to gain? Uh, benefit for the employees. They have to pay a little bit okay. more and, um, but uh, it's a very popular program in the state. Okay, so it doesn't directly impact the town of Johnson other than you have happier employees and in theory have better retention. I'm going to 
um, when we start getting into the cost study, that's when I'll be able to answer that question much more accurately as to what it means to us. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Beth. Got anyone else, Brian? I don't see anyone else. Quick question. Go ahead, Nat. Um, the the county court the county tax is going up um, related to the Hyde Park sewer upgrade. Wondering it, that appears not to impact these budgets all that much. Uh, I'm looking down through the lines here. I'm sure it will, but I'm just looking to see um, how we've distributed that. I think that those not are gonna be absorbed by our administrative costs. But I'm gonna make a note to double check with Norm. Yeah. Um, because it was so minimal in the past and, and I see Walter's on the line here, I think. But it was so minimal in the past that it was not a line in communications or patrol that used the facility. So right now, the, our plan is to, uh, uh, to absorb as much of this as we can um, through our county budget and in our administrative budget. But that is for those people that don't know, that's significant. I think uh, we went from a $1,000 line in our county budget, the sheriff's portion to $18,000. So. Thank you. If no one's got anything further, we'll give Roger a final word. If there's anything additional you'd like to say here. Um, just about the um, what's going on in Johnson. Um, you know, we've had several, we've worked with other municipal agencies and everything. We've had some, some uh, success uh, with the drugs, uh, drug investigations. Uh, a lot of folks coming in from out of state. Um, uh, St. John Street was quite a, an issue and uh, we've made an arrest there. And uh, so that still is, is you know, one of our priorities there. Uh, and other than that, uh, I don't really see any major, major issues. Uh, we've got the arsons that have been uh, uh, occurring and you know we're still working hard on that, and and uh, uh, you know hopefully hopefully we're going to get on top of that with uh, uh, perhaps offering a um, a reward for some information if it continues to happen. That's the next step. So, uh, but um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, you know I think we've had a fairly peaceful year. Everything other than the drug stuff going on. So. Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank you, Roger, for zooming in on it uh, with us. And I guess we'll be looking forward to those uh, final budget uh, numbers and so we can put them into our budget. We're going to have to work on that some more. Yeah, I apologize. Uh, I will get those. I'll see what happened with the front office there, but I'll get those, Brian, to you tomorrow. So that'd be terrific. Thank you, Roger. I'll be in touch tomorrow. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. Thank Happy you, Roger. Year. So next up on the agenda is uh, our legislative legislators. Uh, we'd ask them to come in tonight. And I first of all would uh, congratulate both Rich and where have you guys been gone to? Dan <laughs> for getting reelected. And I okay. see Kate trying to get in. I'm not sure if she's in yet. It uh, doesn't look like she's quite connected yet. Okay. I'll give her a second to get connected here. And I want to thank you too for joining us tonight. Thanks for having us. Okay. Kate, it looks like you're in. Your mic is still disabled. There you go. Okay. 
Okay, can you hear us, Kate? I can, can you hear me? Okay, well, thank you for joining us tonight and congratulations on your election and, and going down into Montpelier to serve. Uh, we do, uh, this is something we typically have done, uh, usually in December, invite legislators in just to see what the legislative priorities are gonna be and to share some of our concerns here in Johnson. Uh, I sent out an email with some of the things that were on the top of my mind. Uh, and I think I would wanna add to that as a very first item, maybe that the three of you could discuss is, uh, I realize there's gonna be a short file of some over a hundred million dollars in the state budget, how this may impact NVU, which is very important to Johnson. Uh, some of the COVID-19 stuff that's going to be coming at you and how that could relate to town meeting day, uh, which is coming right up for us. And some of the stormwater uh, things that we have to implement and their cost in a study we had done by LCPC showing over a six year period, about three, three quarters of a million dollars in cost. And if you back out what we probably will get from FEMA mitigation for the Scribner Bridge, we're still something over half a million. And you know that's a lot of money in the town of Johnson. So with that, um, I know you guys don't have your committee assignments yet. Uh, you may not know what's gonna happen down there, but uh, who would like to go first and tell us some of your thoughts? And if you wanna address some of the concerns I had, that'd be, I'd welcome that as well. Should we go by Let me go first. <laughs> or we go by age. <laughs> yeah, like, thank you um, for being so nice. Um, <laughs> I and I am the only one with total white hair. Um, I think Doug is the only one as white as I am in <laughs> that I see on here. Um, so first off, um, and I did send out um, an email to you, Eric, and um, I think Brian, um, outlining um, for town meeting day. Um, um, tomorrow morning before the legislature starts, um, the joint fiscal committee meets and they've asked us to appropriate a million and a half to go for, um, um, for towns to be able to apply the money to the Secretary of State's office to um, um, do um, mailed Australian ballots. So you may wanna think about how you wanna deal with that and, and what you would do around that issue. Um, and I think in the background to that, um, there will be bills in the legislature within the first 10 days of the session um, going through the GovOps committees um, that will give towns that would um, that are interested the ability to move the town meeting date back or often um, the second of March. Um, so um, tomorrow is uh, um, the, at the joint fiscal committee will be the first thing around that. So you may want to um, that may be something within the next couple of weeks that you want to um, pay attention to and um, and get up to speed on. So that, um, that and, and the Joint Fiscal Committee meets tomorrow morning at 9.30 to deal with the funding issue, the million and a half. Um, the second question, or the most important question I think you asked about was your first, and that was NVU. Um, it's gonna be a difficult year. And um, I think um, people in Johnson that care about uh, NVU uh, need to be on their game um, as far as I can tell, and it may be, it may be more than this, but certainly um, the uh, preliminary sheets that I've seen coming out of our joint fiscal office um, the appropriation for higher education in this second round of federal COVID money is about $34 million. And um, that 
is for me disappointing that it's such a small amount. Um, and, um, you know, you're right, Eric, our projected deficit um, for within the state budget is someplace between 100 and 150 million. It goes up and it goes down and um, revenues lately been doing a little better, but that was back in um, um, when the last revenue estimates were done, it was around 120 million. Um, and so that puts us in a position where there's very little room within the state budget to move without help from the feds. And the when you talk about um, the state college system, they have told us that they need $40 million this winter to, um, um, to stay solvent. So when the feds have only set us 34 million, um, we could send all of that to the state colleges and not recognize any of the need of any of the other um, 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 players. Um, not recognizing VSAC, not recognizing the university or anything like that, and still not have enough to deal um, with the issues at the state colleges. So my hope is that the feds come up with more money in the next few months around that. But um, um, the, that, what that really means is communities like Johnson need to remain vigilant and, um, and pushing their support for um, Northern Vermont University. Um, you know, I, I, you know, as a graduate from there and, um, um, you know, keeping um, NVU um, healthy is um, my biggest concern, um, bar none. Um, it is um, the most important issue um, in, um, in this county as far as I'm concerned. Um, so there's two of the things you brought up and I, I ought to let Dan and Kate um, do say something. Thank you, Rich. Uh, who's next? Sure. Uh, Kate, you want me to go next, or? I think Kate's been muted. Uh, again. You're gonna All right. Yeah. Hey, I'll just I'll I'll just talk real quick. The senator went over quite a bit of the stuff around the state college system, and and you know the fact that there's a forty million dollar ask and thirty four million coming in um, is definitely going to be something we're going to have to keep an eye on and. Um, you know, there are a lot of competing um, voices for not only the federal money that's coming in, but, you know, the, the state money that we already had. One thing that is good is, you know, with the federal dollars that's come in, um, the billion dollars that we've got, we're going to see, in, we've seen increase in revenues. Um, not sure what they're going to pan out to be. We've got a joint fiscal meeting from uh, the Joint Fiscal Office coming up, which will, you know, is it 150 million? Is it 200 million? Is it less? We don't we don't know what the deficit um, is going to be, and uh, you know, so definitely interested in um, what um, NVU looks like. The funding for that. One of the things in the past um, that we'll see when we get committee assignments, uh, the majority of our appropriations committees have been in rural Vermont and I hope that continues so that um, they are in the districts that represent NVU, um, the state college system. So um, I think that's important to have that representation on our appropriations committee that are the ones at the table making um, those decisions. Um, in terms of um, some, I mean, I'll talk about a couple of a bill that I'm working on that uh, I spent some time on today is uh, looking at uh, how older Vermonters get nutrition services through Meals on Wheels and really looking at the bigger picture on how that's delivered at the state level, the funding that comes from, um, from the states, from the feds. We have money through economic services for three squares that goes to a lot of older Vermonters and making sure that, um, you know, we're doing the best we can to get uh, 
nutrition, adequate nutrition out through our Meals on Wheels programs and our Meals on Wheels programs have the money they need to operate. So I've um, been meeting with a bunch of people trying to develop a, uh, a nutrition act uh, with Teresa Wood from Waterbury, who's uh, hopefully will be on the Human Services Committee with me. Hopefully I'll be back on that committee. Um, working on some recovery housing legislation this session. Um, Office of the Child Advocate and um, looking at making sure that home and community based providers um, are adequately uh, funded as well. So um, just a few things that uh, that I've got going on. Obviously, the DSL uh, internet issues are going to also be pretty high on the list this session where we see a lot of people trying to uh, do their jobs from home school. Um, you know, we really need to address that. And I think that um, with the CUD work that's been going on and the grant, they just got a grant today, I saw. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Kate, last, but certainly yeah. not least. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I was muted. I couldn't get my age jab in at Dan. I was like, I thought we were going by age jam. So I'll say it now when I have audio um yeah thanks for for having me you know I, i'm not sure i can add much to what um rich and dan have said in terms of your specific questions eric you know there's a lot that we don't know i think um one thing maybe i can say a little bit more about is the um town meeting day bill that i know is is like probably the top immediate priority in the house in terms of really wanting to get it passed as quickly as possible so that we can give guidance to you all and, and how to best move forward with your plans for town meeting day. And I um, sent a draft of that bill, I think onto you, Eric, and also yeah. um, to the town clerks. And so um, I think you can see in the nature of that bill is basically like try, the state trying to be as flexible as possible so you guys can just structure things in a way that works for you. Um, but I know that they're also open to lots of input. So if there's anything that you guys feel like you see bubbling up or you're in need of like please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know um happy to answer any questions i do just want to take a minute just to like pause and reflect on what an intense year this has been for everyone but certainly for municipal governments and johnson in particular i just want to send a huge amount of gratitude your way to everyone on this call, specifically the select board members and the village trustees. You guys have, I mean, from every conversation I've had in the community, I've heard about what a challenging year this has been and the fact that you all keep coming back <laughs> and showing up at the table and doing this incredible work for your community during a pandemic but pandemic alone the content that you guys are working on is so challenging and i just want to commend you and i also just want to say that you know that is a, a lot of what i heard during the campaign from folks who who are doing this really committed work in the municipal governments is just how overburdened people feel and you know I'm sitting here as a newly elected person i'm going to do a ton of listening this first year in every arena that i'm in but and I certainly could never make any kinds of promises about anything, but I just want to say just as an introduction to like to, to sort of who I am and my priorities that I, I really want to be available to you all if there's ever anything that you feel like we can do on a state level to help support the work that you guys are doing locally. I know a lot of it comes down to finances in the end often and obviously that's challenging and it's a relationship with the federal government, but even just just support in any capacity to take on some of the challenges that you guys are taking on right now, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's racial and social equity work, like, please just keep the lines of communication open if there's anything you think that we can be helpful with. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Thank you for those kind words. Uh, just wait and see what you got ahead of you. <laughs> Probably we don't even measure to that. Okay, at this time, I'd open it up to board members for any questions. And I see Doug's got his hand up. Yeah. Um, I have an observation and, and, and questions with regard to broadband, uh, specifically, um, the, I, I'm on the executive committee of Memorial Fiber, and, and what I see happening is that uh, is, is a repeat of what happened when Comcast came through or when DSL, the 
the uh, the basis of being able to financially viably bring broadband to the last mile is being undercut by uh, the the continuation that after Comcast is in, the uh, other companies are coming in, they're picking up the rest, uh, uh, or some of them, and they're going to leave. It's not, a, there's not an overall plan how to bring broadband. And I really strongly suggest that, that the state invest in the CUDs because they, uh, and consider how to give, how to lock up turf for them, because if they don't, we are going to still end up with our rural areas being separated and not being served because the companies with incentives are coming in and picking off, off the other stuff. So you really have to be careful. I had also have an observation that, uh, uh, and I'm not proud of this, but uh, Vermont Electric Co-op is the, is the utility that's least cooperative with the uh, bringing of broadband to our rural communities. It's my understanding. I, I think Dan and Kate have muted. Okay, they're back on. Hey, I can uh, just just briefly, Doug. Um, I was in a discussion today um, around looking. We have to reapply for the Medicaid waiver for funding for Medicaid at the state level. Um, this is how we do um, a, a lot of our, you know, it's billions of dollars. Um, and one of the things that we're talking about is, is how do we find out if we're allowed to um, let people who, older Vermonters who are on Medicaid, on Social Security, be able to use those Medicaid dollars to pay for an internet connection for uh, companionship, for um, telehealth, telemedicine, um, you know, obviously that would increase the take up in our uh, rural areas where a majority of older Vermonters are. Um, so there's definitely talk of that, that that's going to be coming up this year. It might just be another source of funding that um, we might be able to use to have a, a better take up rate. I would like to say that you need to really build, you need to fund building capacity in the CUDs because if you don't, uh, there, there's going to be a race first in because it's, you know, millions of dollars to put in this infrastructure. Uh, and if, if you don't build capacity as well as making it advantageous for, for the CUDs to be there, you are not going to have your rural area built up. Doug, I just want to uh, respond to that. I mean, I, I share your concerns and I think, you know, it sort of I think one of the things that's coming up in terms of COVID recovery is we obviously have these very immediately pressing needs and there can be this rush to funnel money into short-term solutions. And I just want to say that I echo your concerns in terms of um, wanting to ensure that we're advocating that we be putting funds into long-term solutions, which in Vermont is the COD system is the long-term solution at this point in time. And so how do we make sure that we're not, you know, sort of cutting our legs out from underneath us as we're, you know, throwing money into these immediate term solutions. So I don't, I just want to name that I hear you and I'm with you. And that's definitely something that I'm going to be advocating for as well. Thank you. Any other board, Nat? Hey, thanks for being here with us. Um, I think, um, you know, Eric in particular really hit on the the um, points that I was going to hit on, especially uh, Northern Vermont University and and uh, stormwater runoff. Um, the the other, oh, uh, actually, I did send each of you an email last week about um, just an outrageous this outrageous this thing that's going on in Vermont state prisons with um, just widespread sexual abuse um, on the on the um, uh, perpetrated by um, um, employees. And uh, it, it is just so deeply disturbing um, on a human level, but also thinking about it from a, uh, a municipal level, the amount of work, blood, sweat, and tears that goes into community development, 
um, dealing with the opioid crisis um, in all sorts of ways. And then to have people sent into this, put into this system that further just makes it worse and, and just drags people down even more is just outrageous. And, and Kate and Dan, I got um, really thoughtful replies from you and I, I thank you for that. And I ask you to just keep, keep, keep on it because uh, that's crazy. Um, that's more of a comment. My, my question is about pilot funding. Um, and if it's possible for us to keep track of revenues from the local option tax so that we have a better idea of how we can, how we can, what we can expect going into the next budget year, if that's possible. Um, and also just a thought that I'm spending more time um, buying th with the pandemic, buying things online and going into Williston less and less. So the state's losing out. If anybody's, uh, if a lot of people are doing what I'm doing, this, the state's losing out on that local option tax. Um, I'm expecting those revenues to drop accordingly and that maybe it's worth thinking about adding in a 1% tax on online sales um, to recover some of that revenue. So thanks. I would, uh, Nate, I would um, just say to you that um, um, it's a very recent phenomenon that we're getting any tax from the online companies. And mm -hmm. everything, um, everything has been a struggle to get Amazon and to get any of the online companies to, um, to pay. And you're talking about uh, a nearly a 12 year court battle to get them to, you know, um, I am, would totally be in favor of um, 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 adding 1% to, um, um, to the online company's tax, because um, I think in many ways, more of the market is moving there and they get away with murder um, um, when it comes to these. Amazon went for years and refused to pay anything. Um, but um, that is a difficult battle to take them on. Fair enough. So are, in terms of tracking the, um, the local option tax so that we get a sense of how our pilot funds are gonna be affected in the coming years that, how do we crack into that information? Well, it, you know, there is every year, um, um, the estimates are set, Dan mentioned that joint fiscal, the state economists, both um, Tom Cavett and Jeff Carr come together and we set the estimates. Within those estimates, there is an estimate of the local option tax and what it will do every um, twice a year that are all calculated within that. And they base the budgets on that. So, um, and it's always a projection out to what we think is going to happen. So it's never um, an exact science to get there, but you know we can. Um, um, I if you contact me and you contact, I can get you what the estimates are um, from um, the economists around that, and maybe that would be helpful for you, but. You know, it's never absolutely clear um, yeah. what it's going to be. You know, um, yeah. case in point, the um, the year we just bet went through, no one ever could have it, uh, predicted any of this, and the last recession, um, you, you couldn't. But um, um, we can we can get you um, more current information. Yeah. yeah that because in a couple of weeks, we're going to be sitting around a table metaphorically and, and, and trying to figure out how much money we're going to be getting from that. And I, I'm sure Tom Kivett has uh, much uh, better estimates than we do. Yeah, so and, 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 and I, sometimes around the 15th, um, he, um, they will update their revenue estimates so um, we can get you those figures. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. In, I don't, what has it been in the past? Like it's right now, it's around 450,000, somewhere around there, I think was the last um, amount. So I'm not sure what it's been in the past, if it's been moving at all. So yeah, I, think I can go look, I, 
I looked at it today just to see what it was in the last, which we paid or the town, um, the state sent the money in the first half of the budget instead of waiting till the second half of the budget. Something I talked to Eric about early and we did the, the mini budget. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, let me just um, um, say something about um, um, corrections. What you lay out in sexual abuse in, it, it is appalling. Um, the problem in corrections right now is they have a vacancy rate of over 10%. And um, they're having a terrible time finding people, um, um, corrections guards to work. Um, and the leadership in, um, um, in corrections is totally under fire. And um, how to, um, you know, certainly um, what you outlaid, it um, can't be happening. Um, and I think people are in corrections are trying to do, but their, um, um, you know, their vacancy rates are, are, are appalling. And um, they have huge budget holes. And, it, you know, it's, um, um, it's not a good situation all the way through corrections. Okay, any other board not, members? Oh, oh keep sorry, going. Sorry, no, I was just gonna follow up quickly um, and I can sort of email you separately, but um, I, am, I, have, I have followed up on that email and I'm gonna be meeting um, with someone within the corrections committee, but also um, with some advocates towards the end of January to talk a little bit more about um, what their priorities have been and what they're working towards. And so I will keep you in the loop, um, but feel free to keep keep in contact and I'll let you know as that develops. Thank you. I know it's, it's, it's a lot easier for me just to sit here and be outraged than it is for you guys to actually have to implement solutions. So thank you. Well, it, it ultimately is going to come down to um, a budget issue. And it, that's one of the um, um, most ticklish areas within the budget right now to deal with because of the shortfall and because of the lack of employees um, or, and the lack of people that want to go to work in correction, period. And we really have been doing a lot more investing in diversion programs to try to keep people out of that as I stated I think we lost Dan he'll be back yeah must be the mm -hmm. connection up there in Wolcott just <laughs> we Dan sorry Dan we completely lost all of what you said Sorry. Uh, said, um, you know, we've been, we've done a lot more investing in diversion programs. Um, I don't know if you can hear me now, but yes. uh, you know, it's trying to keep people out of corrections. Okay. Well, it, it, to give you numbers, we've cut the number of people that are in, um, in corrections facilities by a third in the last um, seven or eight years. Okay, open it up to any other board members. Just quickly, um, thank you all for being here. It's great to see your faces. Um, yeah, a lot of what my concerns are have been brought up. The one thing that I haven't heard anything about that I'm, and a few of you know, dealing with personally right now is just um, Vermont Health Connect and the absolute dysfunction with that system, healthcare system that, um, it's just, it's, since I've moved back to Vermont, it's just been a complete nightmare. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm hoping um, that some attention be, be put on that and because um, we all deserve healthcare <laughs> and, and uh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get it here in Vermont. It's just been so disheartening. Um, and especially during a pandemic. And right now my family is facing not having healthcare for, 
for the entire next year because of a glitch in the system that kick that we didn't um, weren't made aware of until we the grace period was over, and so it's just it's just crazy. And um, and when I talk to people, you know, um, I'm I'm looking into private insurance now, and you know, from, they say, oh, you must be calling from Vermont. We get a lot of these calls, <laughs> and so we, there's a there's a reputation out there that Vermont Health Connect is is really not not working and not working consistently and not working well. So um, we can talk about it more, but that's something that's of um, a big a big concern for, for me. And I think many people, many people that I've talked to. So thank you. Okay, anybody want to talk to that? Or do you, I do have Mike you? Dunham who hasn't asked any questions yet. I'm not I, going uh, either. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, Ryan, do we have anybody from the public? Well, I think Kate has a reply. Oh, okay. Sorry, Kate. I didn't see. No, sorry. No, it's totally fine. And I keep muting myself because that's like usually the Zoom etiquette, but then I realized that I'm like bumping myself out of the audio of the meeting. So sorry, I'm going to work on that. But um, just to follow up from, from Kyle's statement, you know, I just empathize with your experience and I know you're not alone in that experience. I know you know you're not alone in that experience, but that doesn't help. Um, but also just wanted to follow up that I um, have also scheduled uh, have a meeting coming up with a healthcare advocate, um, the person who sort of helps run the healthcare advocacy within legal aid that does a lot of this work. And so um, again, can follow up with you more after that conversation, but um, just want to empathize with your experience and just stay in touch and I'll be in touch as well with what I hear. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brian, do we have anybody from the public that like to? Uh, we do. All right. Uh, Beth, uh, go ahead and unmute. Um, I have a couple of things, sorry. Um, to play off Nat in terms of taxing, alcohol is really cheap. Alcohol is a problem in our area. I can attest to the twisted tea containers lining my road <laughs> that I know Kyle has seen too. Um, an alcohol tax would not hurt anyone. It maybe makes some people mad, but they'll still buy their alcohol, I can promise you. Um, so there's that. Um, and Doug, the first this is the first I've heard that Vermont Co-op has not been cooperative with the high-speed internet. High-speed internet, as we all know, is a huge equity problem. We have our school systems having remote learning um, three days a week for the high school anyway. I don't know what the elementary schools are doing, um, but that is an equity problem. And um, the Vermont Electric Co-op had the same problem years and years and years ago, and they were the solution to that problem. So I would hope that they would be more willing to help be the solution to this problem now. Um, so hopefully somebody on the co-op can bring that to them or somebody on the board. Um, the last thing is the thing you all expect to hear from me, which is about NVU. Um, and I will just say $40 million is not, I get it's a lot of money, but in the big scheme of things, it is not a lot of money. And if we're talking about having a state problem where our state is aging, we need to bring young people into this state. And you bring young people into the state by having college systems here that are here to support those young people coming into the state. They may not all stay, but some of them will. And if we do not bring more young people into our state, everyone is impacted. These, these financial discussions we're having right now are going to be sixfold what they are right now, 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now, we have to bring young people into the state. And I really hope that everyone who's making any budgetary and financial decisions around the state college system understands that. It was a top priority in 2020 before COVID hit um, to get the younger demographic uh, growing in our state. Well, there's only one way you're gonna do that. So I really hope that it's not about what you're passionate about at this point. And it's not about what you care about, what you wanna spend your money on, what you're 
um, you know, what your thing is that you're fighting for. It's about the future of the state of Vermont. And are we going to fight for the future of state, the state of Vermont or aren't we? And I really hope that everyone is thinking that way in, in the state. I don't care if you're um, an elected official or someone else, everyone in the state should be thinking that way. Um, so anyway, I really just hope that that message is really loud and really clear. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. She's usually pretty clear. Uh, is there anyone else, Brian? I don't have any other public comment. I'm not sure. Dan, did you want to reply to that? I thought I saw your hand go up. Uh, nope, just giving the thumbs up. Totally oh, okay. agree. Um, you know, it definitely is is our pipeline of young people to this state. And uh, I think it definitely has been a priority in the past uh, or hasn't been the priority it should be in the past. And I think we're seeing it now as it's in financial trouble. So thank you. We need to keep talking about it for sure. Doug? Yeah, I, I'd like to say that I really agree with Beth. And I'd also like to tell you that broadband is going to bring in young families. You, you put you put broadband in and you'll find that uh, people have discovered remote working. You know, it may slacken a little bit, but I see uh, people moving into Johnson, young families, you know, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's uh, there's two strong economic tools here broadband in our rural area and NVU. I, I have to say that the disappointment with the federal bill that just passed um, is that um, higher education, um, we would have hoped was way more than 34 million. And in the broadband area, it seems that the only money that they're sending is money for hookups for low-income families to places where there is already fiber running near their house. Yep. And, um, you know, the problems that we're going to face in the state budget this year, our largest revenue source is income tax. And the income tax that will be paid April 15th is based upon people's incomes for 2020. And with the situation of the state all through 2020, um, um, business has been down and we don't, we will not have the revenues in April that um, um, we would all hope for. So, and because the state can't print money, we're at a loss to help everyone without some federal help. So I hope that, you know, towns like Johnson and people in communities like this are very clear with the congressional delegation in Washington that we need more money for broadband and we need more money to help with higher education. Agreed. Okay, Brian, do we have anyone else? We do. Uh, Greg, I've got you up next. Hey, how, how are you guys and, and ladies? I hope you're doing well. Happy New Year. Um, I've been working with the LEDC quite a bit and uh, we're going to try to work on uh, maybe a little bit more friendly business atmosphere in the state. I think COVID has hurt budgets throughout the country, but Vermont's uh, economy has been pretty stagnant in population for quite some time, and uh, this just makes it worse. I feel like until we uh, welcome business and make it easier for businesses to come to this state, uh, we're never going to grow our population. Uh, people need opportunity, and uh, when it's so hard to get an Act 250 permit, uh, people aren't going to invest in this state. It's really that simple. And until we have investments, nothing's going to grow. And we're going to continue to lose young people and uh, young families because our rents are so high and our pay is so low because we don't have proper opportunities here. So I don't, I don't 
see how this economy changes until we make this state a business friendly state and uh, make Act 250 easier to work through and more predictable. So I don't know what you guys uh, have for an answer on that, but to me, that's that's a huge, huge issue for our state. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Anyone else want to field that question or statement? Dan? I'll just, I'll just, Greg and I have been talking about this um, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago. So, you know, I think that um, last session we did have some discussion on Act 250 in the um, Natural Resources Committee in the House and um, they didn't get very far with it, but um, I'm not sure what they're going to be taking up this session. Um, around Act 250, any changes to it or anything, but definitely be keeping my eye on it. And uh, Greg and I came up with some ideas. We're going to be bouncing around to definitely see if we can um, bring that to the committee or somehow get some uh, movement on, you know, helping towns in village centers or wherever um, make it more predictable and, and the ability of people to the build. We were on a meeting this morning and uh, Lamoille Housing had some issues they've been dealing with um, to, to put in affordable housing in Morrisville. So it's not just businesses, it's yeah. also the Lamoille Housing. So. Yeah, I was just going to say, sorry, Dan, I didn't mean to interrupt you, that um, I, I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, Rich and Dan, but I feel like Act 250, just from what I've learned in a short period of time, is seems to have kind of a, a unique contingent. Act 250 reform seems to have a pretty unique contingent of folks who are supportive of it, from the business community to advocates for affordable housing, and you know many in between. Um, and so, from that perspective, I think you know. Of course, none of us can make any promises for the year ahead or the next two years, but I can tell you, Greg, that it's certainly something that's on people's radar and it's something that has a growing contingent of people who are pushing for this reform, which I think is always, always bodes well in terms of movement happening. I, I would just say um, to, to Greg, um, I'm not real hopeful there will be overall reform. The um, Scott administration put together a package last year that didn't get through the legislature. The one area I would hope that we could do something is in transportation. If I'm replacing an existing bridge that is um, um, an existing um, bridge that is in place now, and I'm replacing it, that should not have to go through Act 250. If I'm not um, in any um, major way leaving the present footprint of that bridge. I think that slows the process and slows and costs a lot of money, particularly in it. So it, in my pecking order, if I can't get a whole package around Act 250 passed, um, I would um, concentrate my efforts because I think that is um, doesn't serve anybody well um, to ha put an existing bridge that you're basically replacing in its present footprint should not have to go through Act 250. Do you think there'll be some work on village centers and town centers? Um, I would hope so. Um, you know, as Dan said this morning, um, um, Lamoille Housing is um, talking about how difficult it is for them um, to find projects to do now in existing town centers within our own region um, because of sewer and water problems and and the permitting pro problems and um, and. I think we all know that housing is a major issue here. Yes, yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you. I believe Doug's got something and then we probably should uh, 
get moving on our agenda. I guess housing, Bob, you know, bounced to the top here. Um, and I know we got a multitude of problems, but, uh, you know, I know of three young families that are trying to buy houses in Johnson and can't find, there's nothing out there, whether they want 150, now $150,000 starter, or they want to spend more than a quarter of a million dollars, they cannot find housing here. They're looking in Calus, they're looking up in, in Belvedere, they're looking all over, and there's nothing in this community. And you can see it all in the rentals here, you know? You can't move here if you wanted to. Yeah. Okay, with that, I wanna thank you all for coming in tonight. I appreciate this taking this time to be with us. Uh, wish you the best of luck. I believe you start bright and early tomorrow. Uh, and uh, if, and it's a two-way street. If there's some things that we can help you move forward that would benefit Johnson, please reach out. I'm always welcome, uh, happy to give testimony. And uh, we will reach out to you when there's something that we feel is uh, important to Johnson. Good. So with that, uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Have a great night. Yes. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay. Petition requests. I believe you have none, right? We don't have any specific petition requests. So I'm going to take a couple minutes to review uh, kind of the rules and then we can move quickly through this. So um, the the deadline, even with the the you know, with the town select board uh, kind of offering to make some accommodations for the current public health crisis uh, and waiving the requirement to collect signatures for a petition, petition requests must still be delivered by uh, January 14th. So that would be the, the close of business on, on January 14th. Uh, the select board will be able to take up those petitions uh, and hear them at our uh, meeting the following Monday and get them published on the ballot and town report. Um, and I guess, are there any questions about how that's going to work? I think the biggest thing is making it clear to the public if there is anyone out there who wants to draw up some kind of a petition, that they must have it into the town clerk's office by the close the day on the 14th, yep. maybe posting something on front porch forum and wherever else. Yeah, for sure. I think communication is, is super important there. Um, and then Brian, we've talked about this, but I'm just going to say it again in, in, in a public meeting here um, that it's, it was my understanding from, I think it was our last meeting that unless the petition is filled with hate and completely outrageous where the select board's going to just basically okay anything that comes in. That was my understanding from the, the, the vote before was that, uh, you know, the, the select board was kind of pledging that it would take up you know, relevant petitions, things that are relevant to town business uh, and are, like you said, not hateful or, or, or anything else. Yeah. Was that your understanding, Eric? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. And thank you. Anybody who's interested in running for some office, they have to have their consent form in by January 25th or something? Yeah, that, that uh, request has a little bit longer deadline. Uh, so that would be, I believe you're right, January 25th uh, for a, to run for a petition. Okay. Uh, like our vacant uh, representative with the Solid Waste District, yeah. which is a, a vacant petition that we, or a vacant position that we don't have any applicants for yet. Okay. And what's our deadline for going to the printers? I believe that we're going to the printers on February 1st, but I'm going to ask Rosemary. Yes, the report needs to be at the publishers 
uh, February 1st. Okay. Any board members got questions? Okay, and move on to the social media policy. All right, so we have circled around the social media policy a couple times. Um, you know, so it, it's, we, we've solicited opinions on it and gotten a, a, some feedback from different volunteer committees. Uh, we had some board discussions on different aspects of it. Um, this draft incorporates as much of that as possible. Uh, I do have a little bit of a, some further updates that were suggested and made today, uh, but you know, it, it's kind of what do we want to do with this? Do we want to uh, move ahead with it or is there just really not interest or support in, in adopting anything like this? So we're going to open it up to the board members. Uh, to Brian's point, uh, are we going to move on this or are we just going to uh, drop it? I think the current draft incorporates pretty well what we've discussed and I, I would support it. I would support it too. Um, I, did, I did have a couple questions about it. Are, are we discussing it kind of in detail or? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. Okay. Um, first, I just, I just wanna be clear that this is a, this is a, um, policy just for the municipal Facebook pages and it's not for private pages, it's for municipal pages, whether that be a committee or a or select board or. Yes, it is. Um, and and the intention behind it is to spell out, you know, that when you're conducting official business, you should only be conducting official business through official channels and you know you you're free on your personal page uh, but you shouldn't really be mixing the two too much you shouldn't be using your personal page to sometimes convey official information and sometimes convey personal uh, opinions that it really should be separate that we have official channels for official communications and official business, and then individuals may or may not have their own personal channels. Um, and, and we don't, we don't want to mix the two too much if we can help it. Okay, yeah, so that's my second question. So for example, um, like if I wanted to let folks know about this meeting, yep. under this current, the way this current policy is written, is it kosher for me to then, let's say you posted it, Brian, on our town page, and then I shared it onto my personal page? Yes, that would be permissible. Okay, so I guess I'm just wondering where that, it wasn't totally clear in the policy to me where that, that line is. And especially like when we're going into an election, you know, election season, like what's, what would definitely, it's a little bit easier to say some of the things that are definitely not okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, that initial post was made to the town Facebook page mm -hmm. because that is official information that, that this meeting is happening, it's date, it's agenda, is official information. I would not be able to, I would be in violation if I posted that to my personal page instead of the town page and just said, I could post it to my personal page in addition to the town page, but my personal page is not a substitute for official town communications. But I could, you know, if I wanted to also post it personally and, uh, you know, I could comment on, on it, but official communications have got to go through the official channels. Because of your position? Because of my position, yes. Okay, 
But what if I, for example, went to the town website and got the link off of the website and put it on my personal page rather than going through? That would also be okay because you can communicate uh, kind of whatever you want on your personal page. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really that the, the personal pages are not a substitute for official communications is really the, the goal. Okay. Um, in conversation with Doug, I cleaned this up a little bit. So I'm going to share my screen and share, uh, I've highlighted a section that we, we discussed and I changed some of the language on it. So give me one second here. So this is, uh, section four, we, and we changed a couple of paragraphs here. Um, again, about municipal officials are expressly prohibited from using personal accounts to post official municipal information to municipal social media platforms. My intention with that language is, again, is that post official, official municipal information. So you could not represent your personal account as the official channel for receiving official information. Your personal account is your personal account. The town account is the town's account. You can post whatever you want on your personal account, but it's not and should not be represented as the official town account or the official channel. Mm -hmm. But you can, goes into the uh, next section, municipal officials may post from their personal account, their personal positions on matters of interest to the municipality provided they, Cut off the sentence there. Uh, interest to the municipality provided they. I had suggested that you they identify that it was their personal position, and you wondered if we couldn't, uh, rather than state, you know, and you thought, you know, could we just have a presumption that they were identifying this as their position. That's it. Um, this is this is to what I didn't like about this was that that I thought we should state affirmatively that you can use your personal page to state your personal position on towns, but you have to identify it as not being the town's position or on town issues. Because uh, I I I thought there was down I thought there was pressure on the the officials to they couldn't state what a, what a citizen could state, you know, and I thought we shouldn't be under that. I don't think we give that up when we take, uh, you know, we can make wise or unwise positions, but I don't think we give our right to say what our position is. Yeah, no, I agree with that for sure. So th this new section is an attempt to clarify that a little bit. Um, Brian, something that came to my mind when you were talking about mixing your personal and your and the official town, uh, and I think it works fine for all of the select board members. The concern I would get in would have is this will apply to all town commissions, uh, committees, boards, etc. Almost all of them uh, have all of their correspondence and official business done on their personal email. And I'm just wondering how that would play into this. This does, this is really about social media and doesn't directly apply to uh, email. We could, uh, if we're willing to pay for it, we can move more, we can create more um, 
email accounts for uh, volunteers, but we're kind of limited where it's at just on, on cost. It's so, a couple dollars a month for each email address we create. So the historical society has its own Facebook page that would be part of this social media policy. Yes. Brian, what did you say it costs per email? It costs a couple dollars a month. I'd, I'd have to check. I don't know, not 100% confident on, on the number off the top of my head, but the, our email addresses are not, the, the town email addresses are not free. Well, I, I would uh, like to bring up that you know, we have our own accounts because of Freedom of Information Act, and we try to have all of our town business through the town email system, because if we do start doing stuff on our own personal email, or if we were ever subpoenaed or, or whatever, our own personal email could be used as evidence. And so all of it could be actually looked into and other things that may be if we're not germane to the issue would be up to, to public scrutiny or somebody's scrutiny. I, I think if it's only a couple of bucks a piece, I think that if every, every person that's on a committee should have their own email account uh, so that they're in compliance with the Freedom of Information Act. It might be worth considering it's, it's kind of a separate subject from this policy though. I understand that, but it is something to think about because we we are talking about that specific thing right now. I think that one of the reasons for a policy like this is is to have some sort exert some sort of pressure or have a responsibility for what gets to come in and stay in on our on our uh, pages that. Uh, you know, if there's discussions, I think that we we want to uh, uh, control some of those discussions, or there's certain things we don't want to appear. I mean, you see, you see, um, you know, uh, some thought about uh, the uh, big tech companies, which we obviously are not, being responsible for the contents of what goes on to their web pages and what gets published and spread by through them. And I, I think that we should uh, take some responsibility to. Uh, have our pages be discussions about town business and not be casting aspersions on people. That's a good point. So the only comments I have, I'm not sure where we're at at this point. Are we discussing these highlighted yellow items or can I bring up a different point? Uh, feel free to bring up a different point. So just, just below there, section five, limited public forums. We have the Johnson um, Facebook site, Johnson Vermont, and we have Johnson Recreation, but I believe there are others. Um, so is that not quite a comprehensive list that we need to expand on? We will have to uh, complete this with all of the other for historical society. Uh, I know has several, historical society has some pretty good communication methods, uh, conservation and, um, and others, but no, just, this was, this is not a comprehensive list. Okay. Yeah. If, so if we're just keeping in mind that we're going to add to that, I know Tuesday night live, we should add to that. There's probably yeah. a town Twitter account, whether we use it or not. Um, so. I think we did create one at some point, but uh, I think that we couldn't recover the password on it or something like that. I know that when I was taking over as public information officer for emergency management, we couldn't ever get the town Twitter account. Okay. Well, anyway, just to, as long as we know that 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 we need to add to that um, yeah. section two there, uh, five number two. That that would be my only thing. I. I agree with the changes that Doug has suggested there. Probably five, number one would also uh, include the library. Doesn't, don't they have a- Yeah, library's website? got- uh, 
a number of communication tools too. Yeah. Ryan, can you scroll to section six? I think that's where I had another question. Okay. Uh... So section six really gets into comments that appear on our page, not things that we put out there, but responses uh, that we're receiving. And what do we allow as a public response to official municipal information? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess my, my question on this section was, um, who draws that line? Like who the, so, so this creates a title of a municipal social media moderator, which right. the board would have to name. Okay. And designate somebody as our point of contact for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So would this person police all of our town, you know, from the library to the uh, historical society's websites and Facebooks? I would imagine what we would probably do for this is create one person in charge of town and then people to operate on their behalf on individual committee pages. You know, so that we've got a point of contact, but that this person wouldn't have to necessarily police every committee's page at all times, uh, but could still serve as kind of a point of contact for committees if they needed assistance. Do we think we'll be have the people capacity to do this? We don't have a lot of traffic on our, we don't have a lot of traffic or a lot of comments on our, our pages. So uh, yeah, I, I do think that we can manage it. Um, I can't imagine a future where this might be more uh, activity and we might have, uh, it might be a challenge to manage it, but um, it is not currently. Uh, and on a, yeah, Brian, sorry, I was just going to say, and honestly, I think the committees that do have active Facebook pages are doing a great job of managing them already. I don't think that there really has been any problems. I mean, I think where we've had the problems is maybe more on the town's uh, Facebook page and um, and with maybe some of the, you know, some of the things that we've posted <laughs> that, that under this policy, I don't think would have, would have uh, been allowed to, to be posted in retrospect. And I'm not sure, I can't remember which section that is where we were, the, the part about the guidelines of, of what we're allowed to post as a town. Um, uh, that might be uh, the top of section four, which is another area of edit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I'm thinking about um, the, the, I think the very, the post that actually brought this whole idea of a social media um, um, policy to, to the forefront was um, posting an article about a specific business. And I think somewhere in here was about that we shouldn't, you know, on the town uh, web or Facebook page shouldn't be about promoting specific businesses, um, politics, um, anything with, you know, obviously hate or racist content. Yep. So, yeah, the, the I mean, and, yeah. Hear about that posts may that official posts mm -hmm. uh, should be relevant, accurate, and appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quoting the second paragraph here. Uh, posts should be relevant, uh, relevant, accurate, and appropriate. Uh, relevant topics, emergency information, community events, and uh, business of government. Uh, inappropriate topics would be personal posts, private fundraisers, and political content. Those aren't exhaustive lists, but those kind of give examples of, of what would be appropriate to post on 
you know, the town's Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I get, I think my, my point was that I think that everything, you know, um, that the individual committees have been doing a great job. I'm on social media a lot for my own job and it's, I haven't seen, you know, I, I haven't seen really any issue. <laughs> um, the only issue I've seen is on our own page. I, I don't see this as being a big change from our current practice. This is more, uh, I think it's going to codify a lot and I think it's going to, um, you know, I hope it'll provide some clarity between official communications and personal uh, opinions. What did you do with the, uh... Uh, we, we discussed about at the at the end uh, in terms of uh, enforcement against municipal officials. Yep. Uh, so uh, we the third topic that we tackled was section thirteen enforcement against municipal officials. Um, so we struck this from elected officials. Uh, because there's really no enforcement ability for elected officials anyway. And I changed the language uh, for employees and appointees and volunteers to be in, uh, related to uh, misusing official municipal social media uh, accounts or information so that it's irrelevant for disciplinary action, it's irrelevant to your uh, personal social media use. But it might fall within an employment an employment agreement or an employment guideline. Yes, you could still evaluate. You could, on your personal page, still violate our personnel policy. But you would not. You'd be in violation of our personnel policy, not our social media policy. To violate the social media policy specifically, you would have to misuse official municipal social media. Mm -hmm. What's the board's pleasure? Prepared to make a motion to adopt this media policy or do you want more time? So Brian, oh, sorry. Go ahead, you have got a question. Um, so the highlighted parts are things that you've that you've changed from the original. Yes, there's things that were changed today. Changed today. Okay. So the board has not had a chance to read these changes. Uh, they are kind of just as I described. Uh, they relate to the three areas of um, a little bit more description about uh, official versus personal, clearing up. Um, about what you do with an official account. Uh, a big one to me personally was stating that personal accounts are presumed to be personal opinions mm -hmm. um, and not official communications. And then the last change was the this enforcement section uh, that enforcement applies to employees, appointees, and volunteers and it only applies for misuse of official business. On official accounts. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm personally, I'm comfortable with um, this draft that we see before us with the highlighted yellow um, and I move to adopt. We have a motion, do we have a second? I'll second. A motion is second. Any discussion? It seems to me that, that we ought to, uh, in, it would be an assumption of this that we are going to add the other uh, historical society, the other publications, et cetera, listed that we've spoken about. I would, and it, yeah, I would take that as the, the intent of the motion in the second. 
Can we, ch is there any public comment? Is that? Uh, is yeah, there's, there's a, a fair bit of public comment, I think. If there's no further board members, Mike? Eric, uh, uh, under section 13, so it, this is kind of a typical uh, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, we understand fully that, you know, uh, a board member can't resign. Uh, board members are put on at the will of the voters, but uh, we should still, you know, still should have something in there for us. I mean, if I, if I said something egregious, uh, I would expect the board to maybe say, well, that wasn't a good thing to do, Mike. Uh, so, you know, I don't see any problem with just leaving elected officials found in violation of this policy may be subject to private or public admonishment. So, I mean, you can cut the other part of it out, that sentence, but I think that should be left in there myself. Thank you, Mike. Any further comment? Yeah, I could, the, the, I could go either way on that. And the, the fact is that I have no authority over any other board member to, to get them to resign, if coerce them to resign if they've done something that I don't agree with, so. Well, Dan, you didn't hear what I said. Uh, I, kind of I, I, I struck that, uh, that sentence there. I said, I prefaced it that we have no authority, but yes. I, I did say that if I did something that was egregious and the board thought it was, then I should take my licks uh, like anybody else should. Uh, uh, I don't feel I don't feel as if that we should have the authority to uh, to leave it the way it is to judge somebody else uh, and then put them up to a higher standard than we put ourselves up to. Right. No, I, I understand your point, and I, I I don't disagree. I just I think it's got no teeth. So I'm kind of indifferent on the point personally. Okay, that's go either way. But the and point is. The, the motion has been made anyway, and seconded the way it's written. So it's a, it's a, it's kind of a moot point, but it's still part of the discussion. Fair. And and Mike, this would not address a uh, anybody in the out there as a voter or a citizen. They can uh, post something on our Facebook, for example, the town Facebook, and you know they would. This doesn't address that. Right. Just like elected officials. Right. I understand. We are, without having the authorization in here of being able to admonish, we certainly could feel free to state our opinion. That's uh, true. As to what was said. Absolutely right. So I guess in that case, Doug, it doesn't have to be uh, written in stone. Right. Okay. Unless there's any further comments from board members, we'll open it up to the public. Okay. Uh, Lois, I think I saw your hand first. So you'll have to unmute. Try that again. Okay. I'm still showing you as muted. Oh, you were unmuted for a second there, but let me try again. Okay, that looks like you're unmuted and it looks like it's staying. Oh, good. Yes, um, I can hear you. Evening, Lois. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, the information that I didn't see or get any feedback on was, has, has anyone looked at the employee time that will be used to implement this with the um, town's designated agent, the social media moderator, and the municipal technology officer. I think any one of those three slots that are written into this will have some time attached to it, from which there's a cost, of course. So I'm curious about that. Yeah, Brian had indicated that he thought it would be minimal amount of time, but I'll open. I'll let Brian address that more. I think that for the for the most part, this is what we're 
that what what I'm already doing with the the town's account, what Lisa's already doing with uh, the Johnson Recreation account, and others. So I think that this is mostly already baked into our practice. Uh, I do not see this as a major change uh, for kind of routine operations. I think this will help a little bit by giving us a framework of if there is a problem, how do we deal with it? Um, but no, I, I don't I don't really think that this will add any uh, any time that we're not already using. So just for information purposes, how much time are you using in this kind of an operation based in number of hours within an FTE? So probably about two or three hours a week on uh, social media of, you know, between uh, Facebook, our Facebook account, posting notices, uh, keeping track of when people message the town's account, keeping track of our mentions on uh, social media and kind of uh, keeping an eye on on, on what else is going on with the town of Johnson on social media. Um, but yeah, I don't think it'll have an impact on, on what, I don't think it'll create more of that work. It's really giving a little bit of, you know, we had, we've had comments on our Facebook page in the past that were really felt like they were inappropriate comments that we didn't necessarily want to deal with. Um, but we didn't have a good, we didn't have any tools really to deal with it. Thank you, Lois. Got anyone else, Brian? Yep. Uh, Rick, I've got you up next. Uh, okay, Rick, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, board. Um, I have a couple of questions and uh, I guess the first one uh, would be that uh, as a member of the Racial Justice Committee, this is a joint committee of town and village. How would this apply to the Racial Justice Committee um, in terms of the fact that it is a joint committee? That's the first question. So um, I really think it would apply it would only strictly apply to the town's appointees on the racial justice committee that the village's appointees would have to abide by uh you know any village policies okay um two um if let's say the the racial justice committee uh had public input, how would that be monitored or uh, interpreted? Uh, like what scale would be used to interpret? I mean, as somebody who's been on two Zooms and uh, I, Brian, I, I think uh, you were on one of them uh, that got Zoom bombed around the Working Community Challenge Grant. Uh, it was difficult to try to, um, how to say it, uh, deal with the problem. Um, but do we, and that was clearly uh, offensive and, and not a freedom of speech issue um, because it was hate speech. Uh, but how do we interpret where that line is between a person expressing their opinion um, and some people might find it, let's say, contentious uh, and other people might find it uh, offensive? Um, and I know that, you know, we haven't quite got there with the, the Racial Justice Committee, uh, 
But I think as this thing starts to evolve, uh, we, we might be getting some uh, reactionary comments at least. Um, so how would that apply then to the process that we're working on? So I think this would help the issues faced by the Racial Justice Committee in that it would set out some criteria. And I, I've put them up on the screen here. Uh, some things are going to be very clearly cut and dry. Like you, you mentioned, uh, uh, hate speech is does not have to be tolerated to, in any degree. Uh, but this lays out some ideas and some some examples. It's not a, a, a totally comprehensive list, but it lays out some examples of things that would be uh, appropriate to remove from comments um, because it was, you know, the the one here disruptively repetitive content. So it might not be. Um, it, it, it might not be easy to identify it as hate speech, but it might be, you know, disruptive to conversation and posting something like that repeatedly in an attempt to break up conversation. That the thing, the activity itself isn't exactly hateful, but it is, uh, again, it's disruptive to, a, to the good functioning of the committee and the discussion that the committee is trying to foster. So this would lay out kind of that that's clearly something that we can remove. Uh, whereas without a stated policy, it's a lot harder to remove things that aren't very obviously hate speech. Okay, that's fair. Thank you for clarifying that. And I appreciate, because I didn't see that part of the, uh, of the uh, uh, draft that you have here. And then the third Thing, and I'll, I'll be very brief about that is that uh, there, you made a comment, I think it was in section four, um, and it was about political speech. Um, if you could go back to that one, it was in the highlighted area. And um, the, the question that I have around that is that, well, I'll be frank, um, in this community, uh, some people interpret Black Lives Matter as a political movement. And according to the, I think it's the General Accounting Office, uh, but uh, the federal government clearly delineated that Black Lives Matter is not a political organization and that federal employees were able to uh, talk about and advocate for Black Lives Matter without it being uh, subject to, I believe it's the Hatch Act. So um, uh, again, opinions matter, I get that. Um, so where would something like Black Lives Matter fit under political speech? Because it's being interpreted as political speech by some people in the community and by the federal government, it is recognized as not political speech. That would be something we would have to, that would be a question we'd have to raise and, and deal with. Okay, uh, and I'm asking these questions uh, relevant to the position that I have on the Racial Justice Committee. Sure, uh, but it, it's a fair question regardless that, uh, yes, it, uh, topics of community interest uh, and political content, different people might have different opinions on that. And it is something that we will occasionally, I can guarantee that we will occasionally run into differences of opinion about what's political content, what's a personal post and have to uh, kind of litigate that, have to make a decision and make a call on is this political content or is it not political content? Um, you know, and I think that something like that, uh, yeah, it, it's gonna be something that we have to make a decision on at times. Um, I don't wanna state the board's opinion on that one in particular, especially because we haven't actually adopted the policy yet, uh, but it's probably not gonna be the only time we have questions like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you everybody for listening. Yes. Thank you, Rick.
Is there anyone else? Yes, uh, Jackie, I've got you up next. And then I think I've got Jackie as the last speaker. Okay, go ahead, Jackie. Great, thank you, Brian. Hi, everybody, good to be with you. Um, yeah, my question is just, um, depending on who is managing um, these pages for all the different groups and committees in town, and, and I'm imagining one person will be designated. Is that how it works right now, Brian? Like, so with the Historical Society, one person is designated to run the page, or is this a shared responsibility, or how does that work? That's really up to the committee, and I think it would stay that way, uh, that the committees would manage their own pages. Okay. Um, Decide amongst themselves, you know, who will yeah. do it or who won't do it or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Um, because I've noticed that, you know, depending on the on the page, you know, some some um, facilitators of the pages are, are more responsive or, or less responsive, depending on the group and the page. And, um, you know, responsive to, to comments that you might make on a post or a question you might have or a tag. For some, they never answer you. Uh, for others, they'll answer you within a day or two. So are there expectations laid out for these folks who are managing these pages? as to things like that, hey, you know, answer the question or just respond or, or if you're tagged or is there anything like that? There isn't anything like that at current. Yeah. I think this would help facilitate that kind of conversation about, you know, making clear some of our expectations of what it means to run the social media page for the, uh, for whatever committee, for the right committee or, or, or historical society or, or Tuesday Night Live or whatever, it would kind of lay out a little bit more about what the expectations are for doing that. Right, for kind of best practices and, yeah. and how interactive they should be or not, or that sort of thing. Yep. All right, thanks. Okay, is that still our last question or comment? I don't see anybody else. So, yeah, I, put it that's it. I put it before the board then we have the motion we have the second if and my uh brian you're gonna have to go back to the full screen i can't see anybody yeah. uh let's see okay. okay i'll put the question before the board are you ready to take a vote seeing no more hands raised all those in favor signify saying aye Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. We have a new social media policy. Uh, budget review. How much do you want to get into this tonight? I, Let's I think get into maybe, kind of how are we going to do budget reviews. And then I think that might be all we really want to get into tonight. So would the board entertain and I Scott's still on here so I'd, I'd like him to hear this but uh, trying to envision doing a budget discussion and review over zoom just seems uh, impossible to me I would like to just throw out there for the board if we went into the, uh, the municipal building second floor and kept this socially distance as we can across the room, broadcast the meeting obviously on Zoom for anybody who'd like to uh, watch in on it, but uh, try to do our normal practice of going down through the budget in that kind of a setting, uh, you know, abiding by all of the social distancing and, and uh, mask and all of that. I guess I'm looking for board's thought, board members thoughts on it. And then I would ask for Scott to maybe give his thoughts on it as well. I, I know it's not ideal. Um, I just can't even imagine doing a budget review in this format. So I'll look, Mike. Great idea. Not surprised. <laughs> I won't appear. I figured you wouldn't, Doug. Uh, obviously, you would be part of the Zoom and we would have you as much in the conversation as you could be. Well, Kyle, Nat, what are your thoughts? 
not really excited about either option. Um, <laughs> the, the, the budget. Yeah, I know. I said that. Funny. Uh, yeah, I know. But I didn't mean it funny. I mean, I don't really want to sort of go in uh, and sort of participate in that sort of group activity. And I don't, uh, I find it very difficult to figure out how we would do that, the budget review by, um, by Zoom. So I guess, yeah, I, I, I would do it. I would definitely want to get Scott's input first because he's got some really good insights on, on these sorts of things. Kyle, your thoughts? Um, um, yeah, I, I was actually thinking about this earlier. I don't, I don't know if it would be very difficult to do over Zoom, quite frankly. I mean, we look at a paper. We, if we, if I had a hard co copy in front of me, I, I think. I don't think it'll be that hard, as hard as maybe you think. <laughs> yeah, having a hard copy in front of me would make all the difference. I don't have uh, yeah. a Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, if I was trying to scroll on a screen and, you know, that would be rough. But I think if I had a hard copy in my ruler like we do in person, I don't see why we couldn't just have a like that. Or like this. Yeah. yeah. I think the difficulty with Zoom is the public involvement um you know and the public has a right to be heard i i can see these things going on zoom is slower i agree with kyle i think if we have hard copies uh we, we could have some difficulty with hard copies because sometimes brian was running down and making changes and doing things you know uh but i i think we are far better off uh uh not thinking about, about our responsibility as uh, as to the town as select board members, but thinking about our responsibility for our own health. Okay, Scott, you have some thoughts. Um, yeah, uh, I have a few. So you saw the stats um, today; they're high, and you know we have case counts in Johnson. And our case rate is up incredibly high. It's like in the 90s now, and we were in the 20s. So it's alarming. Um, the new variant that's sort of cruising around um, in three states, hopefully it won't come in Vermont for a bit. Um, that's concerning. And what I've said in the past is you base it on risk. And if you don't want risk, you don't do the activity. And that pretty much ends the conversation if you go down that road. And if there's a need, you can mitigate risk. And I think we could probably pull that off upstairs um, with a little bit of planning. Uh, is there still risk involved? Yeah, but it's reduced. Um, so it's sort of based on the need. And Brian, we had talked about um, HEPA filters with a MERV rating, I think of 12 to 14 ish for the town building. Did that ever happen? I believe it did. Uh, Alliance was in, I'd have to, uh, they were in over the holiday, so I'd have to check their work order. I wasn't in the office when they were here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Alliance has been in and I have a completed work order from them. Okay, cool. Uh, because... And the order was, I forget the Mer I get the, forget the MERV rating. It was not the one we wanted uh, because our system, we would have to do a complete overhaul in order to yeah. uh, accommodate the, the highest rated filters. But um, the some, we got the highest rated that we could fit and some sources seem to indicate that that would be enough. Right, yeah, I'd seen a few of those studies. So if that happened, we just added the risk equation. So that's a good thing um, because it would be one of the things that's recommended anyway under public health. Um, so it's up to you folks. I mean, if you really need to sit down and for folks who have that risk um, with their own health, if they want to sit out and zoom in, that's awesome. But if there's other folks that need to sit in front of a screen and watch the the magic of a pointer and rearranging budget 
in person, um, we could probably figure something out that would help reduce that risk. But I would want to see temperature checks too for everybody coming into the room, just like the employees go through. Matt, you had a question? Yeah, actually, I had I had some clarity as, as Scott was talking. Um, it, it occurred to me, circling back to something Mike said, do as I say, not as I do. Um, we were also setting a, an example and also been pretty tough on community groups that have come to us and asked us to meet in that space or another other town on buildings. So um, I think it is going to be tough to do it through Zoom or tougher in some ways. But um, a lot of things with this pandemic are tougher and um, people are, are making do and figuring it out. So as, as leaders, we should do the same thing. Huh. Good point, yep. That, that's some wise words there. I um, didn't expect it, it just came out. I was like, God, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> uh, with that said, would the board like to give it a try on Zoom with paper copies in front of us all and our practice going down through it with a ruler and see if we can make it work on Zoom. And obviously if we can't, then we'll have to go to plan B and see if we can get in there. Let's do that. Okay. So Brian, we'll need some good printouts of budgets yep. and we'll have to set a date to get together for a budget meeting. So we'll make it, we can make accommodations to do all the printing here. I know that the, the budget prints best on oversized paper that a lot of you won't have at home, yep. uh, but we can make arrangements for you to pick up paper copies here from the office. Uh, for members of the public that want a copy, um, we can make those arrangements too. I expect that for, uh, you know, that folks that want them that aren't municipal officials, uh, you probably need to pay our, our print rate. The oversized sheets of paper are not cheap. Um, but we'll make accommodations for anybody else who would like a print copy. Uh, looking at the calendar, I think this is going to be one of our biggest challenges for this. Uh, Wednesdays look like good dates for uh, taking over the Zoom account for an additional budget meeting. Yes, because next Monday, the trustees are meeting. Next Monday, the trustees are. Uh, this Thursday, racial justice is meeting. Uh, over the weekend, library's got some programs. Uh, recreation also meets on Thursdays. Somebody else meets on Tuesdays, but they're not. Uh, they're not on this calendar and they should be. I have meetings on Wednesdays, the first, third and fourth Wednesday of the month for the CUD. What time? Seven. So next Wednesday, you that would be the second Wednesday you'd be available, correct? Yes. Is all other board members available next Wednesday? We'll try to put something together. The yeah. 13th? Uh, whatever it is yeah the day okay mike i don't see why we even have to bother with it on the last page it says the estimated change the tax rate is zero so it looks like we have our budget all done <laughs> yeah i'm gonna make a motion though <laughs> okay so we'll get together next wednesday at seven um uh, eric yes I do, I do, and I think Doug touched on it wisely, um, that um, public comment could be um, uh, make the conversations much longer. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't want to, um, I want people to have their say, to be able to chime in and say, have what they have to say. But if we have 20 people coming to every budget meeting, giving everybody the opportunity to chime in with every line item, um, just could make for a really um, a, a really prolonged yeah. process that's a little unwieldy. So I, I don't know if there's a way to manage so as, well there. As this is only a working meeting, um, I probably would just keep it to board members until the very end. And then even that the end of that night will not be our final budget 
Uh, so there could be public uh, input provided at the end of our meeting, but they shouldn't have to be, uh, or I wouldn't open or recognize public members to comment on every single line item as we're going down through it. Yeah, okay. Right. You're correct, we couldn't uh, manage a meeting in that sense with everybody. I still want and people to feel shut out if they, you know. Need to I know everybody will want to be here because it's like watching paint dry. <laughs> Mike? We've had lots of budget meetings before and absolutely nobody was here except us. I know. Can you believe it? Right. And so uh, <laughs> it's like you say, you know, break out the paint. Well, you forget, there was always one person that's there and she's watching you right now. Volunteer Lois. <laughs> she always comes to budget meeting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I well, do have some public comment if we're- Okay, yeah, if you got anybody from the public. All right, Beth, uh, go ahead. I really like budgets. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, so with you, Lois. Um, but the thing I was going to say is, you know, Eric, your comments about making it, it's really difficult to have meetings like that. Uh, I talk to my boss about budgets quite often, and we spend hours doing it. And there are some really good tools in Zoom, and I understand those tools shouldn't be opened up to people like me <laughs> and the rest of the public because it really does need to be a working session. But I think it's worth probably investing a little bit of time for folks who do need to go through those working sessions to understand how to use things like highlights and pointers um, within the, the tool itself. Um, it will be helpful when you're not on the same page and you wanna look at something very specifically together or you wanna highlight something. But that's just my first. The other thing is um, also with the tools, um, having two monitors really matters I have a monitor where I look at people and I have a monitor where I do all of my work. Um, and I don't know if that would help Eric because I know you often, you know, I want to see faces when there's a presentation and there's a way to do it, but you need to have two monitors to do it. Anyway, that might be worth like borrowing a monitor from someone while you go into the budget discussions if you do it remotely. Um, so just some pointers like that I wanted to share. Um, and then lastly, being a budget person, I really hate printouts personally. Um, I want everything in a spreadsheet because you can do really quick calculations in the spreadsheet. So I don't know if that, uh, I know for rec, we used to get them in a CSV file. So uh, it might be worth Brian for this activity, folks who are familiar with a spreadsheet, that may be easier. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to provide either a, a spreadsheet for people to follow along with or a, uh, or a copy or kind of whatever is most convenient for folks. I think the three old white guys probably need the spreadsheets printed out. You racist. <laughs> okay, any other comments from the public? All right, uh, do we want to get into the budget draft or we're just gonna save it for the upcoming meeting? Let's save it. Wednesday night. All right. Uh, let me get back on track here. A merger study update. So uh, the ball is currently in our court. Um, so the village has requested uh, the, the changes that we each made. Um, and I am just, I am reaffirming uh, that we are not contesting the changes. We are not asking for any changes to be made to the town's data on the chart on, I believe it was page six. Uh, the village had a number of changes that they wanted to make. Uh, Kent has asked us to affirm that there's no changes that the town wants to make for that. Does anybody recall? Having concerns with that? No idea what's on page six. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know there was a very few things we even identified. So it was I, not anything that we had asked to make changes on yeah. in that meeting. Then that's the answer. Yeah. 
I just wanted to okay. move on uh, from that. So my understanding is they asked to, to agree to certain changes and you said no. Right. Well, we had back and forth about some of the changes. The most recent uh, the recent discussion with Kent was, let's see. I'm referring not to Kent, I'm referring to, we had a joint meeting with the village trustees and they asked us and we said no. Well, th there were some, some of their changes that we did adopt. Okay. And this, is, the, the confusion came from a section that the village asked for changes to the village data and the town did not. Um, Kent suggested deleting the table altogether. Uh, the mayor said that that was not what they had approved, offered some suggestion. I said that, you know, the, the, was, she was suggesting was outside of the scope of what had been approved. Uh, by the town and uh, we're a little bit of back and forth and I just want to reaffirm that we are not we're not requesting any changes uh, other than what the village has said that the village needs for for themselves. Uh, I, I can't agree to this without having it in front of me because I recall there were certain things the village wanted us to agree to and we said no so I don't know what you're referring to. Yeah, and I think you're referring to when I voted with the trustees and four select correct. board members. Can you bring it voted. up, Brian, and show us? Yeah. That's what you're referring to. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, the part I'm referring to, the changes that I, I want uh, kind of reaffirmation for is not any change, is just the changes that we agreed to, and we're not making any additional changes to it. So it's, but let me bring up what we had agreed to. I, I thought it was spelled out pretty well in those meeting minutes. It was all over at last uh, joint meeting. I don't know why we're talking about it tonight. The vote was taken four to one and I thought we should move on. For so Brian, what Kent is asking, you did not think the board gave you direction on that particular question? Let's see. Kent's exact comment. Oh, the words I see. Is, let's see that there was no data for page six uh, included for the town. And he was confused. Oh, I'm gonna pull this up. This is what we sent in. And on page six, the village had some requested changes that we agreed to. I'm not sure about anybody else, but I've just got a blank screen. Yeah. Blank screen, all right, let me try that a second time. All right, you still there? Yep, I uh, can't here. see anything. Okay, okay. the Word yep. document up now? Yep. So on page six, the village made a number of requests. Uh, we agreed to the changes that the, the village wanted, but we did not make any of our own. Uh, so the table that the village made 
ends up here and we didn't I didn't add anything to the towns because I didn't make any changes to what he had come up with. The town did not request any changes. And so Kent's question is reaffirming that we don't want any changes. Right. And okay. I don't think that you need to vote on this. My interpretation is that you have voted on this, but this is kind of where we're at right now as I'm going back to Kent saying we, did, we, we have voted on this already. We have agreed to the village's changes and we're not making any changes. The town is not making any changes. So is he going to provide a report so we can have that going out to the voters? I'm expecting so. I think that needs to be clear to him that we want to put this out for the voters to, to vote on for town meeting. Yeah, I think he's, he's quite clear in his email that he wants to be done with this too. Okay. Brian, you, you just said that we agreed to all the village changes. Didn't you just say that? Yes. We didn't. We, we agreed to all the village changes on this section. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Not all of the I, village changes throughout the whole. Right. Okay. As long as this section is clear, uh, I don't want to have any muddied up here. No. Yeah, I don't think you need to vote on anything. You've already affirmed it to, to my satisfaction that these are the changes you want. Um, it's just circling around again that I'm going to resubmit. These are the changes that we agreed to. Okay. Yep. Well, I just hope this doesn't delay this to the point. We're, we should be on track to have this for town meeting. Well, we need it before town meeting. We need it. Well, a, yes, but yeah. that we, we need it before, but I mean, to, to get every all of our ducks in a row. Uh, I mean, we need this before voters. I mean, we should give them at least three weeks to read it and understand it. Exactly. That's yeah. what I mean. This should be in our town report. Right. This report. And then uh, the ballot question would have, does the town wish for the us to continue discussions. Exactly. And so this got to be done by the 25th. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, question from the public if the board is ready. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Beth. No. Okay. Nope. We're all set. Okay. Can you take it back off? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next two items are some executive session items. I do not anticipate any action. Are there any comments from the public before I take a motion to go into executive session? There isn't any, Brian? I don't see any public comments. Okay. I would entertain a motion to enter into executive session for employee evaluation. I move that we go into executive session to discuss the employee valuation as allowed by one VSA 313A3. And that's it. We have motion. Do we have a second? Second. The motion is second. Any discussion? And I'm uh, taking it the motion would include inviting Brian uh, as well as Rosemary. Sure. Yep. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor, same five saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Show us an executive session at 9.58. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Happy New Year. entertain a motion in reference to Jason. I uh, move that we remove Jason Hill from the position of animal control officer and town constable effective immediately on grounds that he has no valid driver's license and failed to obtain one within the period allowed. We have motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Any discussion? 
Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? The ayes carry. Jason will be removed. Uh, that's part of item seven, correct? On your agenda? Yeah. Okay. Is there any other business before this board? We'll be posting that again with the other positions, Brian. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming and we'll see you on the 13th, Wednesday. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.